The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Um, John Brophy and I agreed that we would uh, that he would introduce the JPL people and I would introduce the non-JPL people. But then we forgot that John himself is a JPL person. And it's not right that he introduced himself, so I'll do that. Uh, uh, John is the leader of, uh, of a very interesting study that uh, uh, actually has already looked at the idea. And the only argument that we had in the whole lead up to this, uh, this uh, workshop and everything else was John uh, claims that it should be called asteroid return mission, and I like to call it asteroid retrieval mission, just to, uh, but that's, uh, so we'll use both terms interchangeably throughout the week. John is the leader of uh, solar electric propulsion uh, development activities at JPL. He's been uh, uh, very active in this area for a number of years, and, 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 and will talk to us now about uh, the previous study at JPL looking at asteroid return mission. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lou. That was a good introduction, given that you made it up on the fly. So I appreciate that. I'm actually going to do two things. One is summarize uh, this study that we did last year, and then talk a little bit about uh, giving you some background in the current state of the art in uh, solar electric propulsion. So this study uh, was done by several people who are here, Bob Gershman, Damon Landau, who will be here later this afternoon, uh, Jay Polk, Chris Porter, Don Yeomans from JPL, then Carl Allen and Willie Williams from JSC, and Eric, Eric Asbog from UC Santa Cruz. Um, that doesn't work. Okay, so what we did was um, we conducted a study to look at the feasibility of returning an entire small near Earth asteroid uh, to the space station. And this was supported by a NASA Innovation Fund in 2010. And we kind of got this idea. We had worked a couple of years earlier on a mission using solar electric propulsion to, uh, to Saturn. And we were pushing a 5,000 kilogram spacecraft all the way to Saturn. So we thought, geez, if we could do that, it seems like we ought to be able to bring back an asteroid of somewhere around that magnitude um, back to the Earth. So we thought, well, let's see whether that's feasible or not. So we started off in this study, and uh, of course, immediately people say, well, why the heck would you want to do that? And of course, you just heard <laughs> from John uh, why you'd want to do that. Uh, we had listed these things uh, here, scientific evaluation or investigation, resource utilization, uh, determine its internal structure for um, uh, aspects that are important to planetary defense. Um, as Lou mentioned earlier, it could be a test bed for human operations in the vicinity of a, an asteroid. And then, and we also said, well, we want to bring it back to the space station because that's $100 billion worth of infrastructure that you could then use to uh, experiment on the asteroid. You have a lot of material there uh, to learn how to, to process it in zero G. And of course, expanding on this, we think is one of the key uh, aspects from the, uh, that this study will um, ah, there we go. Now we're talking. So one of the key aspects that we want to look at uh, in this uh, workshop. We had to uh, impose some ground rules on ourselves to try to uh, make this more concrete. So we said we want to launch by the end of this decade. We want to have only a single evolved expendable launch vehicle, or EELV. A total round trip flight time of fi around five years or so. Uh, then our planetary protection people make, make me put this statement in that you got to have a, if you're going to bring one back to the space station, it has to be an unrestricted uh, Earth return categorization of the asteroid. And then, of course, we want to return to the space station. I would imagine that we'll need to have some, a similar set of ground rules. The parameters may be different, but we need some kind of time phase, time frame for this, uh, the activity we want to do in the workshop. My personal opinion is the sooner the better. We don't want to wait 30 or 40 years to actually do this because I'll be too old. So, um, so what size asteroid? Uh, it's, 
It turns out even really small asteroids are, are heavy from the standpoint of pushing them around. So uh, roughly asteroids may be in this kind of density range. Uh, so even a two meter diameter spherical asteroid, because all asteroids are spherical, right, are, uh, is about 10,000 kilograms. So that's a lot of mass when you're, at least if you've got JPL, maybe if you're at JSC, that's not so much mass, but at JPL, that's a lot of mass to move around. So moving a 10,000 kilogram two meter asteroid um, is uh, roughly where we settle down on. And of course, one of the key feasibility issues then is how do you find such a small asteroid? And that's what Don is uh, going to talk to us about uh, later, later this morning. Uh, but we did find one. Turns out this summer, here's a two meter asteroid that landed in, in China. Um, and I just thought it was interesting that this was in the, the news uh, this summer. Uh, of course, this one is at higher density, so it's more like 25 metric tons instead of 10 metric tons. But. So we're done. We already brought one back. <laughs> so, yeah. um, okay, why, why do this now? As John said, this idea has been around for over 100 years, so why, why are we worrying about it now? Why don't we wait another 100 years or so? Um, and really, it's uh, at least these two things and maybe the third one, um, but certainly uh, it looks like the capability for identifying sufficiently small near-Earth asteroids that you can actually move them around is, is available or becoming available in this decade, as are sufficiently large propulsions, advanced propulsion systems, solar electric propulsion systems that are capable of moving these, uh, these objects. And then as I mentioned, we have the space station, $100 billion worth of infrastructure available uh, in order to uh, use that as a laboratory, give them something to do other than fix the space station. And, uh, um, but we do need the operations in the ISS to continue beyond 2025. So a little perspective. Uh, the Apollo uh, missions returned 382 kilograms of moon rocks in six missions. Hayabusa 2, the follow-on to Hayabusa uh, that John mentioned, uh, they seek to return one gram of uh, near-Earth asteroid materi material by 2020. The newly selected New Frontiers mission, OSIRIS-REx, seeks to return 60 grams of near-Earth asteroid material uh, by 2023. And if we were successful in the mission that we studied, we could bring back 10,000 kilograms by 2025. So that's the, that's the perspective. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, that's a, that's a good question for the workshop. <laughs> okay, so key feasibility issues. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, how do you identify these small objects? How do you characterize them? You've got to characterize their orbits. You've got to determine what, what type of asteroid it is. You want to be able to bound its physical size and mass and various other aspects that are important for actually uh, capturing it and bringing it back. Then how do you capture it? You got to capture it, secure it to the spacecraft, detumble it, and all doing this all while you're in deep space. Uh, are there trajectories that are consistent with our self-imposed rule of uh, five-year total flight time? How big a solar electric propulsion system do you need to be able to do this with that flight time? Can you fit it into a single EELV? Um, is it feasible to bring this 10,000 kilogram rock or rubble pile or whatever it is back to the space station? Does, will the space station people have a heart attack? <laughs> um, fortunately, our initial uh, discussions with the folks from JSC, but they, they were actually, uh, when they got over the initial reaction of, you want to do what? <laughs> they thought, oh, it's not as wacky as it might sound. Um, then how do you handle it safely at the space station? And then what do you do with it once you're there? Um, so, uh, finding them and characterizing them. So, Don Yeoman's going to talk about that after this, so I won't uh, elaborate that on that anymore. Transportation. So, here's our quote from John Lewis. Like all other endeavors so far attempted in space, the limiting factor on profitability of space resource use is the transportation cost. So, 
we looked at what is the best way of uh, moving around the inner solar system uh, that we know of right now, and that's with solar electric propulsion. Uh, and we assumed that that would provide all of the post-launch delta V except for uh, some lunar gravity assists. And it turns out to move about a 10,000 kilogram asteroid uh, down to the space station in about five years requires an electric propulsion system that's on the order of 40 kilowatts. And I'll talk more about whether that's a wacky thing to do or not uh, later on. But the short answer is we think that's very doable. So Hall thrusters, there are lots of different types of electric thrusters. There are the ion thrusters that have flown on Deep Space One and Dawn. There are electrothermal devices, a whole host of electromagnetic devices. But Hall thrusters originally uh, perfected, uh, not perfected, but developed to a, a high performance level in the former Soviet Union are absolutely outstanding. They're going to take over the world of electric propulsion. They have fantastic performance characteristics. What we assumed for this mission is uh, 10 kilowatt thrusters, Hall thrusters that run at a specific impulse of 3,000 seconds. 3,000 seconds. Um, to put that in perspective, the space shuttle main engines, the best chemical rocket engines, have a specific impulse of about 450 seconds. So it's almost an order of magnitude better. Um, and they have outstanding life characteristics. There's some work done at JPL recently that says you can basically make these so they, they do not wear out. Um, and so Hall thrusters are, are uh, the way to go for electric propulsion. So we asked Damon Landau to do some trajectory analysis for us. Since we don't know any two meter diameter, uh, the orbits of any two meter diameter asteroids, um, we had him pick a, an asteroid that he does know uh, from his, the catalog that Don has created. In this case, 1991 VG. It's not a two meter diameter asteroid, but we figured we'd use this as a kind of proof of concept with the expectation that when we do find uh, two meter diameter asteroids, there'll be lots of them, and we can find one that is at least as easy or easier than this one to bring back. So we use this kind of as a proof of concept. And uh, so here we launch uh, from uh, lower, we launch from Earth on an EELV um, and with a total injected mass of about 13.7 metric tons. We spiral out from low Earth orbit uh, and escape from the Earth. Um, by that time, we've uh, now, we've used a couple of metric tons of xenon. Uh, we do the heliocentric transfer to the asteroid. Um, we spend 90 days there characterizing the asteroid, determining its spin state, capturing it, securing it to the spacecraft, detumbling it, and uh, then we depart. So now our, when we got to the asteroid, we were at 10.8 metric tons. We add another 10 metric tons of asteroid material. Uh, and then uh, we do the heliocentric transfer back to Earth and then spiral down to the space station Total flight time of about a little over five years, almost five and a half years. Our guideline was five years, so uh, we're pretty close. If you, uh, you could shorten that uh, if you launch to a, a GTO orbit as opposed to uh, low Earth orbit. But this takes a larger launch vehicle, and uh, so that makes it more expensive. We'd prefer to stick with the, <laughs> the cheap launch vehicle, although EELVs are, are quite expensive these days. Anyway, so, we, so it looked possible with a 40 kilowatt solar electric propulsion system, we could go out, grab a, an asteroid, and bring it back to the space station in, in about five years. And Damon's going to talk a lot more about uh, the low thrust SEP trajectories uh, later this afternoon. We made a little cartoon. Uh, we said, well, how do you capture this thing? So we thought, well, okay, we had one, we worked on one concept. I'm sure there are lots of concepts. In fact, um, uh, Brian's going to talk more about uh, how do you capture these things and so forth. But this is the concept we had for this particular study. Basically had a garage with a high strength bag inside, our trash bag. You uh, match the spin state of the asteroid and drive over it. Um, and then you just, you cinch down your trash bag. It pulls it up against the spacecraft to secure it. And there's also a door on here. so. We have a garage door and the trash bag, so kind of a double, a dual containment system. 
keep the space station guys happy so that we don't have any loose debris floating around the, the space station. As I said, uh, lots, there's lots of other concepts, and uh, I'm sure this group could come up with some uh, really innovative ways of, of doing this. Um, you have to account for the fact that the, this asteroid could be, have wildly varying characteristics, could be a very high strength object or a relatively low strength object. So in typical JPL fashion then we go through, create our master equipment list and list all the things and come up with uh, uh, an overall mass estimate for this vehicle. Um, we, allot, we allocated 200 kilograms for this capture system, another 50 kilograms for instruments. So a total flight system dry mass of about two and a half metric tons um, with margin, because you work at JPL, you gotta have margin. Um, and so we actually could launch 50% uh, more of that. And of course the way JPL calculates margins, that's a 33% margin, but it's really 50% more mass. Um, anyway, so we launched 13.7 metric tons. We bring back 10,000 kilograms or 10 metric tons. And basically what we're doing is we're trading nine metric tons of xenon for 10 metric tons of asteroid. <laughs> of xenon's very expensive, so I don't know if that's a good trade, but uh, at least you get a lot of asteroid material back at the space station. And it's a return ratio of, of not quite one to one, 73% or so. No, so the question is, do the asteroid retain, remain spinning? So if it's a single axis rotator, we would rotate the spacecraft to match this asteroid spin state, drive over it, grab it and secure it, and then de-spin the whole assembly. And we need to do that because the, the SEP vehicle has to be three axis stabilized to, to work. Okay, so uh, that was really, that was the study that we did, um, and then uh, in preparation for this workshop, we said, well, what if, if we don't bring it back to low Earth orbit, which is hard because you've got to spiral down through the Earth's gravity field, what if you had the same flight system but brought it to a high Earth orbit instead? Then what size asteroid could we return, assuming the same, our generic uh, asteroid uh, orbit characteristics? And so Damon uh, ran that for us. Here's the same launch mass, uh, same total flight time. <coughs> But now, amazingly enough, um, we can actually bring back uh, to this high Earth orbit, and high meaning roughly around the orbit altitude of the moon, or something that you would get captured into by flying past the moon. Now you can return, f instead of 10,000 kilograms, 500,000 kilograms. Again, this is off a single EELV launch vehicle. And uh, so this is now getting closer to what John said, a mass amplification factor of 35 to one in a flight system that is, we think is very uh, doable with near-term uh, technology. So that's pretty awesome. But, uh, so now, uh, earlier today we said, well we should, John said we should think outside the box. Okay, so here's our outside the box uh, oh, thinking uh, before I get to that. So a, if we go back to this table, a 500,000 kilogram asteroid is about seven meters in diameter. So now we're talking about something that's e a little easier to spot than the two meter diameter asteroid, roughly. All right, but outside the box. So the human spaceflight architecture team, um, one of the things that Lou left out of my introduction is I'm currently the point of contact for the, the SEP vehicle for the human spaceflight architecture team. And they're considering the development of a 300 kilowatt solar electric propulsion vehicle. So we we're just talking about a 40 kilowatt vehicle. <clears throat> so now we're talking about a 300 kilowatt, but just to make the math easy, I said, well, let's make it a 400 kilowatt, because you know, what's 100 kilowatts amongst friends? This is kind of what it looks like. You can package it uh, relatively easily within the uh, heavy lift launch vehicle. Uh, has high power hull thrusters, a really uh, outstandingly big solar array, but now this is 10 times more powerful than than the 40 kilowatt vehicle. So if we scale everything up by a factor of 10, instead of a 500 metric ton asteroid, we can bring back a 5,000 metric ton asteroid, or five million kilograms. And so now you're talking about uh, an asteroid diameter that's on the order of 15 meters. And as Nathan, I think, Nathan Strange immediately said, 
So now this kind of puts a lower limit on what, what size asteroid you would actually send people to, because you wouldn't send people, uh, ast uh, astronaut crew, to an asteroid that's smaller than one that you could bring back. So uh, I thought that was an interesting perspective. So now, uh, how, how realistic are these, uh, these SEP vehicles? What's the current state of the art? Um, NASA has flown two deep space missions with electric propulsion so far. Uh, one was Deep Space One, launched in 1998, had a, uh, about a two kilowatt, uh, two and a half kilowatt solar array, one gridded ion engine, but it was uh, very successful and it retired the major risks of how to fly a solar electric propulsion vehicle in deep space. Uh, the second one is Dawn. Uh, Dawn is currently flying now. It's in orbit around Vesta. Um, the use of electric propulsion, solar electric propulsion on Dawn has uh, uh, saved at least $200 million, maybe more, depending on, on who you talk to. But it, it reduced the cl mission class, at least from a new frontiers, maybe a flagship class, down to a discovery class. So hundreds of millions of dollars savings through the use of electric propulsion. Uh, this is Dawn. It is in orbit about Vesta. This is the movie that, it, or, that they put together on, during approach to Vesta. Um, the amazing thing is uh, the electric propulsion system allows them to go both to, to two main belt asteroids, Vesta, and then on to the dwarf planet Ceres. Um, it has a 10 kilowatt solar array at 1 AU, and it has already provided a delta V of uh, over 6.8 kilometers per second. And by the time it's done, it'll be a little over 11 kilometers per second. So that's the kind of delta V capability that uh, solar electric propulsion can provide uh, even today. Internationally, there have been three electric propulsion missions. One, the small mission for advanced research uh, tech in technology. This is a European Smart One mission used a hull thruster to go to the moon. So they started in GTO, spiraled out. Uh, and went into orbit around the moon. Uh, Hayabusa, um, as we mentioned earlier, so a, a, uh, a near-Earth asteroid sample return mission. And as John said, it, it managed to bring back some, <laughs> some tiny fragments of dust from uh, uh, Itakawa. I used to say, I thought the asteroid was Itakawa, but we were at a conference and they, the Japanese call it Itakawa, Itakawa instead of Itakawa. And then the Gochi mission, another uh, European mission, uh, which is a gravity uh, mapping mission around the Earth, and they use the electric propulsion to make up uh, a drag makeup because uh, they're flying very low in the Earth's atmosphere. Commercially, there are now more than 53 commercial communication satellites flying uh, xenon ion propulsion. And the largest of these now routinely have solar arrays that are on the order of 24 kilowatts or so. So our 40 kilowatt size vehicle is not uh, that big a stretch from a 24 kilowatt uh, commercial uh, solar array. We would like it to be lighter weight, but you know, that's, that's a technical detail. And as I said, hull thrusters are, are taking over the world. And if you count all of the satellites with electric propulsion, not just the ones that use xenon, there are uh, over 200 satellites and counting. So electric propulsion is now firmly in the mainstream of technologies uh, available to the aerospace community. And the reason for that is, is in this chart. So what we did was we took, we looked at each year since 1959 and said, what's the highest power uh, spacecraft, solar powered spacecraft that was launched in that year? And then we plotted that power level against its launch year. And uh, aside from the one watt on Vanguard in 1959, uh, it follows roughly a curve that says the power has doubled every four years for the last 50 years. There are some exceptions, um, and those are shown in red here. One is CERT-1, which is the space electric rocket test. I'm sorry, CERT-2. Space electric rocket test number two. It had a kilowatt of power in 1970. It was well above this curve, so well ahead of its time. And then, of course, the Skylab space station with almost 10 kilowatts of power was, again, well ahead of its time. You could make the case that we were originally on this curve instead of this curve, but this is the one we wound up on. 
Now, the two missions that NASA flew with electric propulsion, Deep Space One and Dawn, are well below the curve. And what that shows you is that solar power uh, in space, the availability of that power has caught up to and maybe gone beyond the needs of electric propulsion. And so that's why NASA is actually flying these. Having lots of power, solar power in space, is no longer an unusual thing. The other interesting thing here is the Little Dawn spacecraft, which is a low-cost discovery mission, it has more solar array power than the space station from 35 years earlier. Um, and then speaking of the space station, here is, uh, these are the, f the four major builds in the space station. So it's a little bit of a cheat because uh, we keep adding them up, but it now has about 260 kilowatts of solar power and has that in old uh, uh, technology solar cells. They're about 12% efficient or so. If you replaced, if you had the same area as the space station arrays with modern triple junction cells, you'd have a power level of around 700 kilowatts. So space station arrays are, are quite awesome. And as I mentioned, hall thrusters, high power hall thrusters are taking over, uh, and that's because they have extraordinary performance characteristics. Uh, you can build hall thrusters that have specific impulses that range as low as 1,000 seconds to as high as 8,000 seconds, depending on how you run them and what kind of propellants you run through them. And they're very, very scalable. Uh, people have built hall thrusters that run down as low as a couple hundred watts, actually lower than that, but I didn't want to get carried away, and as high as 140 kilowatts. So that's a factor of 1,000. In not, it's not in one device, but in, in the technology it can be scaled to very low powers, very high powers, very good performance. This magnetic shielding phenomenon uh, says they will, you can make them to last virtually forever. And people are now nesting them to allow you to go to either even higher power levels. So uh, if you like thrusters, invest in hall thrusters. All right. So, um, one uh, little sound bite for the capability of electric propulsion uh, in comparison with uh, chemical propulsion. So uh, orbit transfer is basically all about energy changes. So he said, well, how much energy uh, does the, the three space shuttle main engines provide versus our high power hull thrusters in this uh, 300 kilowatt vehicle that I showed you earlier. And so we take three space shuttle main engines. They have an exhaust velocity of uh, about 4.4 kilometers per second. Um, a very high thrust, of course. And the power level is just phenomenal, right? 13.9 million kilowatts. That's an awesome power level for all, all three engines. But it's only an eight minute burn. The total energy in the exhaust is about just under 1.9 million kilowatt hours. And the external tank holds 835,000 kilograms of xenon, most of which, not all, but most of which is used up in the launch. We take our 300 kilowatt SEP vehicle, run seven high power hull thrusters at the same time. 2,000 seconds uh, is, gives you about 20, almost 22 kilometers per second exhaust velocity. The power level is much lower. The power in the exhaust is about 200 kilowatts as opposed to almost 14 million kilowatts. But we run the engines for much longer, 10,000 hours or so to do a typical mission. There's a little over 8,000 hours in a year, so we're talking about a year and a half or so uh, of burn time. But the total energy in the exhaust is almost 2 million kilowatt hours, so it's greater than the energy in the three space shuttle main engines. And to do this, you only use 32,000 kilograms of uh, propellant as opposed to 800,000 kilograms, so an order of magnitude less propellant. So that's why uh, we think with the, with the availability of possibility of very high power solar arrays and hall thrusters and a few other odds and ends that the feasibility of moving asteroids is actually uh, within our ability. And that's it. Any questions? <laughs>